Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And go listen to the Danger Mouse Black Thought album if you have not yet. Everyone, welcome aboard. It's uh, time for Wanna. Uh, as promised, Sypha Sound's not here today. At this point, I don't even know if Sypha's actually busy or whether we just decided that he was getting the off day, so he was taking it no matter what. Because I, we don't know exactly how Sypha's, like, um, recording schedule works, and I don't think he knows until a couple days before, but we had planned on this week to figure some things out. So, special guest popping on to join me right now. And then we're going to have a special guest, uh, perhaps another one later in this show, another one for the Patreon as well. So we're out here hustling, everyone, trying to make it happen. Um, hope everyone's doing fantastic. Hope everyone enjoyed the little uh, bonus content we hit you with last week, the Tracy Morgan, <laughs> uh, whatever you want to call that. Um, and uh, after that, the bonus episode with Snoop Dogg. Um, and Daz, where we talked about Nate Dog. So, yeah, the Tracy thing was just last week he showed up with Time to Kill in such a – he was in such a zone that the way he showed up, I was like, oh, man, I can't waste – I can't waste this guy's time. You know, like it's – there. It's my, my uh, Ballard – my friend Ballard hit me after I posted the picture with Tracy Morgan, and he hit me. He was like, yo, bro, sometimes I'm I'm jealous of your life. Um, it was like a video of, of hanging with Tracy outside the studio. And it, and it was a nice moment, you know, and Bal's one of my best friends, but like, it was a nice moment for me to stop and go, oh yeah, sometimes I forget how cool this gig is. Like, I'm used to the fact that I have interviewed Tracy Morgan a countless amount of times, you know, um, including multiple times on one app. I think multiple times on one app, but I, I that's the thing. I can't keep track. There've been so many times on 97. Saif and I have had so many different run-ins with him in different ways. Um, and I was like, you know what? This is pretty cool. Speaking of, uh, of pretty cool, I mean, listen, you guys listen to the podcast, most of you. And, and, and again, shout out to everyone listening right now to the free episode. We love you. We appreciate you. We super appreciate our uh, Patreons, uh, patrons as well. Um, and we're, we're, we're finally getting close to that 700 mark. I, I hope this is the week that we crack 700 for the first time. But we're, we're thankful to everyone who's on the patreon.com slash one up is life and everyone who just listens for free every week. I wonder if our guest today is a, is a patron. I guess it, Billy June would know. Billy June, do you know if our, if our surprise fill in for Scythe is a patron? He was. Now I'm going to check to see if he still is. <laughs> that would be upsetting. If we lost, I remember him. seeing it and screenshotting it, and I go, I don't think. Well, don't this sound is like famous. a creep, bro. Yeah. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, well, the, I, wait, I, I don't think. Juan Epper came up to me last night. I know, I, I know, Billy Jean. What, what happened yesterday? I went to the closing of the Knitting Factory. Uh, Hannibal Burris closed it out mm -hmm. with his live band. He rapped, brought mm -hmm. a bunch of guests, and a uh, random dude walked by me. Yo, Billy June, love the pod keep doing it i was like what and my friend next to me was like what just happened and i was like oh this is the one up there you go see billy pretty fucking cool pretty fucking cool so that's that wasn't the first time it's happened every time you have you know what you're good it kind of surprises me because i don't because i'm not i don't think people know what i look like sure i hear you is have you ever considered that like you're just so weird and awkward that they're like that could only be Billy June? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of random cool shit, like like I, I got sidetracked, but I know not everyone's on social media because a lot of one eppers have a life and aren't doing that. I posted today uh, this commercial spot I did with 2K Sports for uh, the new PGA Tour 2K23. And uh, super, super cool. It, it was a funny little small cameo. It is, I am literally in it for a combined, there's a there's a shot of me saying the following words. Play the game your way. You hear that? You hear how good that is. Play the game your way. And then 
immediately after that, they show like a digital version of me, a, a, a game made version of me, which looks much more like a, a thin Ebro or Drake probably, but we're going to take it and call that Peter Rosenberg. And um, yeah, it was just super cool, man. Like I went out there and did that. Um, i trying to remember. I'm sure I talked about recently going to LA and that was the purpose. Oh, and look, Cypher Sounds is here. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Mark Ronson. What's up, Mark? Yes. Too sorry. Did you really think it was Cypher? I'm so sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> no, no, you did not disappoint me at all, Mark. I, I was very, I'm very excited. This is Cypher Sounds has Mark Ronson as a fill, and this is like a double accomplishment for Cypher. Not only can he feel good that he's shooting his TV show with LL Cool J, but he has Mark Ronson to fill in for him. Pretty good. Yeah, unfortunately, now the show is just Epstein. I know. <laughs> Which, by the way, not a great name for a show. Oh, yeah, that's crazy. How are you? <laughs> it's such a pleasure. You know, it's uh, such a last-minute thing. And, of course, uh, I'm such a fan of the show. I'm like a kind of late late discover of it as as i told you but uh how wait, how late R remind me because i mean we spoke to you like a couple of years ago when we first got back doing this again but how late a discoverer of it were you like probably when you called me to ask me about the nas film i think you called me and i was like what that what is rosenberg calling me about i just you know one of those it was certainly i was happy about it but i i i don't remember i was ever speaking on the phone and uh, and so I picked up and I think, oh, yeah, I should listen to that. I love those guys. They're very funny. And so I listened to that episode and then I was just hooked. And I don't really listen to a lot of podcasts either, you know, so it's like it's a it's a fucking hilarious. It it suits my grumpy golden age <laughs> shit, all of it, you know? Yeah, uh, I really, really appreciate that, dude. You are you are by far you are by far our coolest, most successful, richest um super fan that we have so we we deeply appreciate as Saif and I are constantly aspiring to be better we deeply appreciate having you on board I I was I was like googling you before because like you just like sort of occupy a space in my head but I don't necessarily think about like researching you because I'm like oh we'll have Mark jump on and we'll just be two Jews talking hip-hop shit and yeah and can speak meta one ep language because he listens to the show yeah and then the thing that popped me the most was this is so basic and every celebrity has this, but the, the shit on Google that says people also ask, have you ever looked at your people also ask? No, I, I've said, I've, the only one that I saw was like, is like the questions asked, right? But no, tell me, what does it say? All right. Well, the first one is, is Mark Ronson a nice guy? That's the one. That's the one that I saw. And it's 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 bizarre. Cause I, that seems like a fair question, but I've never seen that about any other uh, person you know it's it's well, a weird thing the, well so how i guess the point is like how nice a guy must you be where that's your brand People yeah are like so so is that mark ronson really a nice guy is he really that nice yeah i guess so i i get a i, I get a lot of like is does mark ronson sing that's one because okay, seem... no, I'm, I'm gonna get to the others hold on okay there's, sorry there's a, sorry i laughed no, no. multiple times at this okay, okay. So, the okay. first one is Mark Ronson, a nice guy. They quote a Guardian article, of course, a Brit that you are, um, famously a nice guy. He also has a reputation for making quite heavy weather of the business of being himself. Oh, yeah. I, that's that's not exactly the, the, the words I would use to describe it, but I think that sounds accurate. Um, that's an English way of saying he's a neurotic Jew. I think it's exactly what that means. I mean, just like he's always saying like, oh, he's he should be happier. You know what I mean? Like, I guess that's kind of what they're saying. And is that, I, is I, that a is that a British saying that uh, quite heavy weather? Yeah, I think it's like uh, I think it's just a kind of intellectual way of saying like he, he sounds like it's always it's very hard to be him or, or he should be a, <laughs> going around just like fucking groupies and having a good time. Why is he? <laughs> Right, but he can't. so much but he yeah. can't because he's a jew that's what's all layered in there yeah, got it yeah um okay uh, okay it's so boring one what is mark ronson's most famous song um uptown funk is number one of course uh what is mark ronson's accent is is uh fourth on here yeah that's that's i get a lot of shit for that for sure in fact i i see i was born in england i feel like every time like feel so defensive but <laughs> 
I was born in England. Mark, how old are you? You're like 47 years old. I'm 80 years old. I'm 80. I'm actually older than most of the countries I've lived in. You're still explaining your accent. All right, keep going. Go ahead. Give us the spiel. I want the speech. This is the thing. And because a lot of people, like whether it's like, or DJ Scissorhands who know me from a certain era, always give me shit when I when when I see that. I'll explain why. I grew up in uh, in England. I moved here when I was eight, and I moved here when I was eight. And people said, "You know, what's your fucking accent?" You said, "What are you a commie?" Because this was like peak red scare. <laughs> and every, like, their only uh, option was commie. That was the only place. option. And yeah. I couldn't like was you know obviously it was like well I'm from England, not Estonia, but nobody really gave a shit. <laughs> so I quickly tried to sound English, you know. So by American. So by the time I go back to England for my first, literally three months later, Christmas holiday, I see all my English friends and they're like mate why you sound like such a yank like i could i every already like could not make my accent work and you're, for and wherever you're, i live you're how old eight years old so at eight you're already now split in the i'm not quite an american and i'm not quite a brit yeah and you just say every word weird tomato tomato bath whatever so so when i went back to live in england after you know making my name as a as a dj in clubs in new york city and when i had this uh thing in the late 2000s i was back in england and my english accent really came back so people started to see me on tv who only knew me as a new yorker sounding like very like oh then i was with amy like whatever (laughs) i can't even do it now because i was literally doing like a liverpudlian accent now now that i live back in new york and i run into some of those people um I uh, I just get a uh, I just get a lot of shit. Whatever, who cares? It's I, such a stupid- I don't know. I find it immensely entertaining because I, I I without a doubt I'm just being completely transparent. Whenever I first talked to you, and I, I don't remember when that was 10, 15, No, it must be closer to fifteen years ago when Syph and I were getting started. I remember having at least funny thoughts about your accent, like, oh come on, dude, are you yeah. really Brit? Now keep yeah. in mind. I hadn't at that point done any five seconds of basic research that are like, no, yeah. born in England, moved to New York. There's a lot of reasons why you would have a weird accent. I just went right to, I love the guy, but he's obviously an industry douchebag who just talks with a British accent. Yeah, no, I mean, I think of all the people that I've laughed at on, t- like Madonna, Joss Stone. Oh, like, like, the ba- what Madonna's the fuck is classic. What's up with that accent? And, and it's just like, it's just, it's just some fucking adaptability survival shit that's in all of our DNA to like fit in or something. But this is it. This is who you are now. I don't think it's changing at this point. I hope not. That would be fucking nuts. Um, so you grew up on the Upper West Side, right? I did. Yeah. Where exactly? On 90th and Riverside. What, what, what was 90th and Riverside like back in the, I guess, early 90s? It's kind of, it was very nice i mean it was just like what it was like it was just all like kind of uh, a lot of jews in my building i remember so it sounds the exact uh, same as it is right now i think so then i moved down to we moved to 74th and central park west for a little while my stepdad was a very successful rock star he's doing very well and then he had a, a, a an accountant that took all the money so then we moved back uptown but um, actually, it was uh, Bert Padel, who you probably know from numerous um, rap lyrics and stuff. Wait, uh, that's who? That's whose apartment it was? No, no, that was his accountant. Remember? Oh, that's, sorry, sorry. That's your cash. My you... cash, uh, Bert Padel. Oh, oh yeah! Wow. So he was the he was the he was like the kind of music industry accountant, and obviously for Puffy and Big and everybody. But he was kind of notoriously really bad at filing taxes. So, <laughs> you know. Now your your stepfather was in foreigner. Yeah. yeah. Did I, I don't I apologize if we had this conversation 15 years ago, but even if we did, no one would know. Um did you talk to him about cold as ice when the sample came through? I did. In fact, um, I think they were having some problems with the with the sample. And at that time, you know, just from DJ New York, I knew scott free and matt life and all those guys from loud and they called me and they're like hey we're having trouble clearing this sample from your pop so i was like oh cool so i call i told my stepdad i was like hey this is a great band you know they should you should clear it. it's a cool use of the sample so they were like cool i mean i think my stepdad did some like very old school rock and roll shit and was just like took a hundred percent of the publishing it's like the kind of thing that me being on the other end of i'd be like these fucking you know rock old rock and rollers they don't understand hip-hop but the fact was it was the same name as the song there was some reasons 
but I took my stepdad to the video shoot to meet Billy and Fame wow. and like go this is wherever crazy. wherever they shot in the bar, I think. And at the time my stepdad was you know, he's been sober for many years, but was still hitting the bottle. And I think him and one of the group were just like getting just pissed at the bar, like having a great time. <laughs> you see it. Um, that's amazing. That's yeah. Amazing. Was, was he nice. was he pleased with it? Because I really think Cold as Ice, it, as far as like aggressive sort of obvious 80s samples go. Yeah, I think Cold as Ice is one of one it's, of the better ones ever done. It's really up there. And in England, especially where it was like a top three maybe pop hit like because in england the charts are sort of wild and like especially before the streaming area much more unpredictable and you could have like a song the fact that a song like cold as ice went to number three on the pop charts is kind of amazing and same with dead prez hip-hop like just just weird shit can can be a pop hit there but it is and it's still one of their biggest if you were gonna go play like a festival i don't know actually i think one of them did it i think it's i think it's in-house Let's see. Let's see. Just going to say produced by MOP. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, maybe, maybe one of the, maybe it even just said Billy. Uh, I'm not Let's sure. See. Let's see MOP Warriors. God, what a great album too. If, if anyone out there listening for some reason is a WANF fan who's like, I never spent time with a full MOP album. Uh, my personal opinion is there are a few to listen to, but I think if you're going to listen to one, it's it's this one. Um, let's see. Cold as Ice. Produced by Lil Fans and produced by Fizzy Womack. Well yeah. done. So yeah, shouts to Lil Fame. Wow, that's fantastic. I did not realize that. Um, okay, hold on. Back to some of the questions on on Google about uh, Mark Ronson. Okay. Um, who is the white guy in Bruno Mars? Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. That is the one. I think I think I might have even started that one because <laughs> it, very early on in the in the Uptown Funk you know campaign when it started to do well but i was pretty much i never had a hit really as a solo artist so no one knew who i was the photographer came to shoot me from like the eight associated press like just a random thing and he told me on the way to work that day his wife was like honey who are you going to shoot today and he was like uh, uh the white guy in the bruno mars video and that was i think i like told that story and then it just stuck and it is perfect it is a perfect description of who i am and <laughs> I'm yeah. fine to have that on my epitaph. Well, by the way, um, how that was 2009, 14, uh, 2014. Well, yeah. yeah, eight years ago. Okay, so oh, so Bruno's already a big star. You 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 had that record done when Bruno was already a couple of albums in. Yeah, we worked together on the second album. I co-produced "Locked Out of Heaven," "Moonshine Gorilla," and and I was just went straight into my record, and it was just like the stars lined up we could that we could have been in his album making his album made that song it just happened that he was like this is my boy mark i want to help him make something good uh and that was it and it was just such a crazy it took seven months it was like there was a lot of times that that song really fell apart in the lab and i would wait a month till everybody like stopped being angry at each other you know because i was the one with the most skin in the game it was for my record and be like hey you guys want to get back together and <laughs> see if we can resurrect that idea that we liked and but uh it was yeah it was crazy finishing that one uh, by the way dude you also have you have a full i did not know this till today and this is obvious i guess now looking at it i feel like a fool but you have a, not only your wikipedia page but you have a list of awards and nominations uh, wikipedia page yeah is, but that that might as well be called the uptown funk page i think i mean <laughs> actually there's there is some back to black on there and of course but i think that that one well, really i was gonna say and also half it. of it half of it is um we all the brits literally never stop giving awards i mean they want an award show every three days if they can have one yeah you got be, mobos yeah. you got brits you got yeah. everything on here but but um but dude you also have an academy award that's that is true. That is something wild that I would never ever in a billion years think that I would say. But crazy. What, did, did you write that record? What did you do on Shallow? Shallow, yeah, I co-wrote it. I did. I actually didn't produce it. You didn't yeah. produce it. You just co-wrote it. Yeah, yeah. With Gaga. With Gaga and and two of my friends that I write with a lot, Andrew Y and Anthony Rosamundo. So, so that's. I have two wedding songs. And in England, I have three, if you count Valerie. It's pretty fucking nuts. I was thinking about... Sorry, go no, ahead. No, please, 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 keep going. I was thinking about when you did the K-Slate uh, Memorial. 
uh, show. And I was thinking like in some weird thing for like Slam Magazine or Double XL or some magazine that doesn't exist anymore. Sorry, do those magazines still exist? I don't mean to be. Rude. I don't think Slam Magazine okay. exists. I, I, double in, XL exists, but fuck, you know how I feel. Fuck Double XL. Keep going. Okay. So I uh, yeah, but there was a weird thing where you know K Slay and I interviewed each other, and and also because I worked with Saigon, you know Saigon was yes, very much a drama king favorite. So oh, yeah. I would go up occasionally on that show. Um, but but what, what I talk just to you. What do you like? Yeah, bring, yeah. You bring you on air. <laughs> you talk to me. I make me sit in the corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I did. Uh, and uh and I'm just uh, to I, picture your accent fitting in with i think Robert i was King, just... who had the best who who had the best disc record ll cool j cool mo d oh wait this is it hot or it's serious hot okay. this is hot this is 2003 so i was still sounding fully new york okay, okay. um i got it but um yeah but he i remember he always talked about this thing and you might know this too he said he always called it the savior ass crate he was talking about like his re his go to records when in you know whatever it's a fucking this was twenty years ago so it could have been Simon Says by Farrah Mancher I want you back I have no idea right but I always think of those like as a DJ all those predicaments I've been in where like fuck I just wish I knew what to play right now where you're like maybe not like your your regular crowd but a, a wedding or a corporate or some shit and every now and then I'm like damn I, I gave I gave the DJs two of those records well definitely not shallow you're not gonna play that in your DJ set but but, but you could, in, you could. In this country, I've won. I keep like bringing it down, and <laughs> knocking it down. And you had three two seconds ago. But uh, listen, but hold on, U Uptown Funk. I, I, here's my question: How do you feel when you hear Uptown Funk? Like when when you're the artist who made a song that's ubiquitous. Funk at this point, Mark, and I say this with the utmost respect. It's not even when I hear it, it's not even like I'm hearing it. It's just yeah, yeah. it's just a thing that exists. Yeah. And I have the same thing that crossed my mind is like, what was the story with Trinidad James in this song again? Yeah. And then like and that's it. But it's it's just a part of our lives. What how does it affect you when you hear it? It's the same. You know, there's records that you make that I mean, with most records, you're actually sick of it before it even comes out. Right. I mean, that record we were knocking back and forth for seven months and just every single inception produced it with Jeff Basker, who did all of it, and a lot of Dark Twisted, just an incredible producer. So the three of us are also fucking persnickety and specific about what we like and in bickering and all this shit anyway. Like to get one song to pass muster with all three of us was already like a fucking, you know, a wonderful but serious undertaking and test of wills and patience. But um, no, I mean, that record, uh, you know, I'm what what it's so crazy to me, which is which is the best part is like when I see these like random things, because I also like Cypher Sounds get Google alerts and I see these like studies that like a song to listen to when you're down or what to do when you're down at work. And it's like a list of songs you can listen to uh, breathing techniques. I can't believe that this song has like it represents I mean, probably not to you who like wants to slit your wrist when you hear it in some ways like. <laughs> For a lot of people, it's like it's like joy or something like it's right. it's like for regular people, it's like the thing that like lifts them up. And and occasionally when I'm DJing, I don't even want to play it anymore. And, and you know, if I'm playing in a, a hip hop party in New York, I'm not going to fucking play Uptown Funk, of course. But even at some point, like I don't want to play it because I feel like the crowds are going to be like, oh, really? It's 2014, eight years later, you're still playing like that like that's the only thing you have left when really, but i realize regular people they want to hear they it. want to like, hear it and and it, and now it's like it's like the three-year-olds that was the thing like after the first year of it like getting like being like a, a hit that people like then it became a song that kids like now those kids who are three are like whatever i don't know 10 or 11 i not like i'm djing for 11 year olds that often <laughs> but but i'll see like i'll be playing no some mark no judgment dude do whatever yeah you to check you know I'll be playing some random party and I'll just see it like maybe 13, 14 year old kids yeah. like, just like go nuts. And then sometimes it doesn't work. You know, sometimes it really is. And I have to like play it. There's nothing worse than clearing the dance floor with a song that you actually made. Like as a DJ, it was, it's the clearing the dance floor is the it worst sucks, thing. Period. I mean, it's a but terrible feeling. As a producer, clearing the dance floor with a song that you made, or, it, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm writing this book about the 90s and the club scene right now. So I'm really reliving a lot of that shit. And it's funny, if you're playing a song that everyone knows the words to, like a Dwick in that era, right? When mm -hmm. everybody would be like, I ripped the mic, like the Pim Pim's host. 
if you turn it off, the crowd singing yeah. makes you feel like you have something to do with Correct. it, right? But it's, that is an important feeling as a DJ to, it's to a, explain. Yes, it's a great feeling, but really, it's not you. It's it's no. actually they're singing along because they love the song. Correct. If you turn it off and they don't sing, then it is all you. It is nothing to do with the song not being popular. This is now your fault. You've taken something that was good, and you've ruined it. <laughs> you fucked it. You fucked it. So. I don't know what that had to do with what you're talking about, but I, I've just I, I, I love I loved how we got there though. What wait how uh what year were you what year were you in clubs in a real way for the first time? The first time I was in a club, like just as a just punter, as they say in my motherland, uh probably ninety-two, but ninety-three I actually started playing. So that was my senior year of high school. 93 is when I started DJing kind of like, you know, high school parties, house parties, whatever. By 94, I was opening for like Stretch and Jules and people downtown, which is cool. And then 95, 96, I kind of like, that's when I was kind of fully like popping. And and I was weirdly like never a better DJ than I was probably at 24. Like I just peaked in 99, I think. So it's isn't interesting. That, isn't that, by the way, you know what, Mark? That's That's so cool you brought that up. I was listening to a mix of mine. I, I recently reconnected my mini disc player. So I've been popping in random mini discs of my old college radio show and like whatever just random mix I made. My I made a birthday mix, like a 1999 birthday mix, meaning I, back in the day when I would do this, it was a party mix, essentially for a party that didn't really exist. Like I would say it was for my birthday. Oh, like, I know. We yeah, know what, those what, mixes well. Yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. So I'm like, this is my birthday. Here's the mix. Would it actually become a party? Know, maybe a few people come over and I make them all sit and listen to it. But the funny thing is I was listening to it and some of it, I was like, yo, at this stage, I knew the records backwards and forwards. My cuts were actually finally getting a little bit crisp and I knew how to blend. Yeah. I was, I think I was better at 22, 23 than I am right now. That's, yeah. that's a little depressing. I, I was, I was at that moment, I was playing five nights a week. Not only the fact that like it was Puffy and Jay and everybody in the club and like, and that was the best music. So it was in New York where, cause my taste is a little bit more commercial than yours anyway. But like, I, I, I was, I knew the record so well it was probably the only time when my taste of my favorite records was right in sync with what the best and hottest shit was. And I could just mm. look in any room like the Terminator when the Terminator looks in and goes did, 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 like does the scan. I did the predator noise, but I meant the Terminator yep. and I and I and I just knew how to kill any room. And yeah, and I was doing I had, you know, all that shit practicing mixed in my room and then AM came along and that was just it like I, AM took. I stole from everybody. Everybody borrows a little bit. AM came, and at one point, we were about the same skill level. I was checking him out in LA, and I was like, yeah, that's he, he makes the Stevie Wonder out of Biggie like I do, blah, blah, blah. And he just stayed in his room for a year practicing to DMC videos. And I went over to his house, and he did the run DMC, just made the motherfucker up last night, just fucked your mother last night into this juggling routine. And I was like, oh, my God, he's gone. And then he managed to figure out how to incorporate it into a party set. And then I was just like, fuck this. I was salty for like a month, but then I had to just give it up. Yo, that's so funny. As I, I wrote AM down on my list of things to ask you about because I, I didn't know what level of close you guys were. It's it's funny. He's someone who, when I watch old videos of him, yeah, like I just makes me want to quit. Like I'm just like, oh, he, oh he's we, insane. We were so close. I mean, before Serato came out, he used to call me on the way to gigs having like a, a meltdown, like really like, I don't know what to do. I've been playing the same fucking records, the same five crates. I don't even know, like I have it. And I'm like, dude, just take a breath. Everyone loves you. You're so fucking best at this. Cause he was still really great. And he was doing crazy routines with like 45s, but Serato came and it just opened this creative palette for him that he could just do insane shit that he probably had dreamt about, but could only get this close to with the shit. And, and then and he was just he was just insane His skills are on another level dude it's crazy how little how short a time he was around kind of after the technology fully changed like he was only around for a few more years yeah so you get to enjoy it but but like there's like a in the way that there's like a before the beatles and an after beatles era of like fucking music and before michael and after michael there's a before am and an after am like any kid totally who can 
cut their ass off and is doing this sort of, I hate the word open format. It makes me want to slip my fucking wrist, but it's, it's like anybody who's, Yes, playing across the board and incorporating some rock and roll. I mean, to be honest, some of the shit was pretty cheesy to me, like as a New Yorker. I thought like, I, I'm not, I don't, Under the Bridge Downtown, Beverly Hills by Weezer, those those are not in the same realm as like Back in Black by ACDC to me, which is essentially a breakbeat. But but what they were doing was so fucking creative. And, and, and he was just such a, I remember like DJing the, the Dynasty Rock La Familia album release party in LA. That was a big quiet flex that you just had. Keep going. For this podcast, right. for yeah. this, I don't know if you know this, but uh, one of our hosts, Siphon Sounds, used to DJ for Lil' Kim. And that was I, a very quiet I know. Flex. Okay. Continue. Well, yeah, because uh, somebody who, when you guys did the uh, Jay-Z, you found the Jay-Z at Summer Jam video, mm -hmm. someone on that same site sent me a link to me being interviewed by some fucking MTV dude at that party. And I'm like, I, I can't tell if I'm like feeling myself, but it's like, it's like, I just feel like I, of course I'm here in front of a giant poster of Jay-Z. This is what I do. But um, I remember- You really did do that a lot at that point, right? I did. I was like, I was Jay and Puff's like probably favorite. They love certain DJs for some of the more rowdy parties, but like I was their favorite downtown album release. I was their guy. Um, uh, and and uh, AM got on and he just- played like one song but it was like the most underground like it was uh oh, i can't even say it because the words are so filthy in the first line <laughs> of the song but uh but yes he was just, a, 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 a am had incredible taste and knew his shit i mean he was from philly originally like but uh anyway he was just the fucking the the best to ever do that shit i i i, I, I sort of think you know, and I think I think there's actually no one more suited to say this than myself. I sort of think in a lot of ways, when you think about that era, you, AM, and A-Track are like the holy trinity of Jewish DJs in, 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 in hip-hop. Thank you. I mean, you would definitely be, you know, wouldn't you be in there? What's the next thing after uh, trinity? I don't know, well, yeah, if you add like loud mouth personalities. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, this this is like, you know, I came up after Stretch. Uh, you know, Stretch was a hit, his own thing. Let's not forget. Obviously, I don't need to tell you. You're talking to a radio show host, <laughs> but he, I, I, I like definitely hero worshipped him. Stole, stole. But some he shit was from... the era before you. He, 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 you did, you did come up. You were in the clubs. Yes, you were in the club simultaneously. But, but yo, you opened for him. That's it. Yes, yes. So I opened, I opened for him. But what I did was. I, I had that rock and roll shit in my background a little bit anyway, because I grew up playing in bands and my stepdad's in Foreigner. And I would be playing, I just want to see how far I could push it. Like I was playing at Cheat on a Monday night. And like, I remember just thinking like, I wonder if I can get away with playing ACDC. And the Benjamins was out and it was the biggest record. And there was that sort of cheesy rock and roll remix. And I was like, if I go to the Biggie verse, at the rock remix right on that biggie verse no one's gonna stop dancing even if it's fucking guitars because it's biggie and this is the biggest record and uh i remember it right doing it right there and then right it goes it's all about the benji's what and looking at this crowd of like you know it was cheetah on mondays was a pretty hood crowd like still dancing and almost smiling like wait i can't believe we're still dancing but fuck it like this is kind of dope and then getting out of there fast enough and then other times i would play it and kind of like you know some drug dealer would tap me on the shoulder and turn around and be like i'm gonna fucking like what are you playing white boy but a lot of the times sorry a lot of the times it, it would work and it was fun and then um I hated the the mashup movement because the mashup was like putting this kind of name on on these more cheesy gimmicky mixes. But mixing instrumentals over acapellas was always really. You but you know, but you tapped into something very important there, which is a distinction that's hard to point out of that line when it becomes cheesy. Because you know, like AM was a master to me at riding that line. And like, I would think he was actually playing something that to me would cross into too cheesy, but his cutting would be so sick on I know. top of it yeah, that yeah. I'd go, fuck, he makes it work because he's that good. But if he just played that record, I'd yeah. be good on it. No, that's the only thing. That's what made it. It was just the skills and the cutting over it for sure. Like throwing California from the OC over breakbeat into California love and just like the way you string it together for sure. But. Yeah. yeah, he was uh, 
He was great. Now, how many of the uh, when Jay Z go on on on? I just want to oh. love you when Jay Z goes through his list of clubs that he parties. No, so at. ghetto, so ghetto. He goes, uh, Cheetah. I'm fucking with the mo- Monday um, nights up. At, what does he say? So Wednesday nights up up in shine. Cheetah's Monday night. I'm yep. fucking with the model bitches. Friday night at life. All, all my gigs. <laughs> to be fair, to to be. How do you think I sold my book proposal? I put that shit at the top. <laughs> Um, to be fair, to be absolutely fair, Cheetah was Jules's night, and I would just fill in when he needed to go to the toilet or he went on vacation. But I love that party, and that was that was great because DJ Jules is some English DJ who really understood funk classics and, and hip hop so well. He he set a real tone and a vibe for that party. But whenever he was away, I was just such who was doing bubbling and Dublin. That that was a cheesy bar in LA that you've probably driven past. Really? Uh, I think it's just after House of Blues on the right. Um, and Dublin's was like... Oh, yes, I've, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and AM might have been doing uh, Dublin's a couple of times as well. It's funny, uh, every now and then... No, please. No, no, please. I, I, obviously, like, your hip-hop uh, knowledge is, is non pari but um, every now and then when you guys are talking about some shit and you're like, you didn't know what Happy Land was on You, Me, Him, and uh, Her, and I'm that like... Was, that, was, just, that was a rough moment for me. Every now and then I'm just like, wow. And I, and I'm just like, I mean, I have to just admit that it's cause I'm really old and like, you could just be old. No, and and you, but you lived here then too. You, yeah, you old and a New Yorker. Old so, and a New Yorker. Um, I'm, I w- I'm, I'm, I gotta tell you, it pains me now that those things still exist because I'm, I've now been here so long that I wish that I had all of them, but I just but, don't. But Happy Lamb was like, 87 like i don't even know why i knew happy land but probably revisiting it through the song i was listening to rock the familiar and like 900 hustler you me him and her like that era of those beats and obviously i was always partial to freeway like that's just it's incredible some of the music on there really holds up some of it is just great because it's nostalgic but uh i don't know no, you're right it's, it's a yesterday. split though it's a split um what do you think of this right do you how often do, do you ever think about this tune right here I know it's probably coming in and out. No, he's a super cat, man. Are you a dan? No, he's a super cat, man. Are you a dan? No, he's a super cat, man. Are you a dan? No, he's a super cat, man. Are you a dan? No, he's a super cat, man. Are you a dan? I'm only getting the acapella. I'm only getting the acapella. Was that like some weird thing, like phasing coming down the line? I don't. I don't know why. There's some. I'm having some problem with the Zoom where it's not taking it. But no, it's the main Kenny Dope version. Yeah, yeah. No. Inc- Incredible. I've been thinking about all these records that like, I don't even know if that's on DSPs, but like, I don't think it is some of the biggest records that I would play. Like when I started out were like Frankie Cutler's Puerto Rico do up the bounce master, like just w- records that were not records that were just party jams that were bigger than the fucking, like half of your, of your set uh, time zone by Africa Bombada, you know, the Zulu war chant with the, mm-hmm. with the real love thing. Like, there were so many uh, fun DJ oh, the spread, break the spread love break. Spread love break. Get up, clap your hands. Kenny oh. Dope had so many of those, actually. He was a the master. Of- the Masters of Work get up shit is yeah, yeah. so fucking good. It sounded so good in the club. Incredible. Or do you have a relationship with Kenny Dope? I do. I mean, of course, he was somebody like I probably opened for a couple of days when I was, you know, a couple of times when I was starting out. So I'm sure like I was I had no ego to like give big like puppy dog energy like all those guys i looked up to clark stretch some of them found it annoying kenny dope um and wait, just wait, wait, wait. found what annoying your puppy dog energy maybe a little like stretch i think of fred in the beginning was just like okay i get it i get it you went to my high school you look up to me it's like I just stand like one foot back from the booth. <laughs> but um yeah kenny dope was a was a hero even the guys like uh i don't know if this was Across your world so much but like Armand Van Helden and like uh oh, yeah. um some of the huge house guys like would come to the little hip-hop spots in their nights off and I couldn't believe these guys like Roger Sanchez who were playing like 10,000 people in Ibiza who I'd heard of because I you know I went back to England to see my dad once a year were like coming to these little little spots you know I I, I was around a lot of those DJs coming up and just sponging as much as I could 
Uh, is is I mean, I I watched your TV show on Apple. I saw your episode with Premiere. Um, yes. Is he your? Is he like the? I mean, it's like almost obvious. It's almost cliched that someone like you or me, it's like he's our God. But is is Primo like God? Of course, yeah. Because, I mean, uh, yeah. I I actually listened. The first beat that I ever got paid for was this remix for Ebony Foster, this R and B singer on MCA, and they got Sauce Money to do a verse on it. Because he was because he was on MCA at the time. Yeah, and yeah. and. Uh, do you have is there any chance of playing because you i just want you to play mm -hmm. it to see if you can you will allow you how big a dick rider you are you're just like you're just like wait what what did you do here What's first of all it's called? it's called everything you do ebony foster Got with it. a with an eye yeah. yeah it was the era of like Mark taking Rod's remix featuring sauce money yeah it was the era of taking a big hip-hop record you liked and making it very on beat out on the trinity but you'll just listen to this and be like excuse me So the screen's looking at me, trying to scope my notes. So Evan, four five, hope that you. I mean, it's like, what did I? I just. It's just, and it's got like the big kick and snare, like the real like track masters or like whatever was going on, Puff Daddy and the Hitman, and I was just literally. But what's so funny is by the, the time. Same year, same year that that oh, came. It, it's it's just a it's just a blend essentially yeah. with a fucking mark tree and a triangle in it, but um. The crazy shit is that the time, the first record that I did that really hit was this Nika Costa record, Like a Feather. And mm -hmm. I, you know, a, a little longer, I developed my sound a bit, but to me, I was still being a premiere clone. So when I played that for the first time, I was actually DJing the D'Angelo Voodoo album release party at this club, Centrify. And Nika was on the same label. The song wasn't out yet, but I, I decided to throw it on. And Premier came into the booth and I'd never met him yet. And he's, he's, I'm like, oh no, here it goes. He's going to come here and fucking serve me a summons. Like what the hell is going on? And he stands there and he goes, he goes, what, what, what is, what's this record? And I was like, I was just stumbling anyway, because it was Premier, my hero, he's standing three feet from me. I'm like, uh, it's, uh, it's Nika Ni Costa, sorry. And he's like, who, who did this beat? And I was like, oh God, he's going to just slap me. Like what's, and I said, uh, it's, 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 I, I did it sir and he just then goes into this head knob for two and a half minutes like this shit is hard and you know it's crazy when you rip someone off a lot of times and i've noticed this not with me specifically ripping people off but like the person you think you're ripping off doesn't always hear it it's a weird interpretation of your your understanding of what they do i mean other than that song you just played which was a total jack but <laughs> i think that you know it was yes of course for so long i was just like I got an MPC. I got I chopped drums in a certain way, and I still wasn't even doing it right. When Premier told me that he never even used the metronome while he's programming the drums on that episode, I it blew my mind. Like thirty years later, um, he's yeah, he's he's a such a freak still. I mean, like still I, so great. The last record, it's like I love the, the last sound. Record. Yeah, it's it doesn't. It's like what something about his specific sound is like Motown. And I can't, I don't even want to try and describe what it is, but there's certain sounds that are, that will never go old because they're the best version of a, some kind of analog sound. And they will just, it will sound just as good. People will be chopping the same kind of drum breaks that Primo was doing for some pop shit 30 years from now. There's just certain things, you know, no offense, but you listen to a lot of jiggy nineties productions from the late nineties, you know, when you're going through, I can't remember whose catalog, even pun, like, and I'm definitely the hugest pun fan, but certain records from that thing with a lot of triangles and shakers, like they just won't age well. It's like Guns N' Roses. It's like, there's a certain thing that's added to the sound to process to makes it too much fixed in an era. But mm -hmm. something about Premier shit is just so raw, so unadulterated. And like a lot of great producers from that era, tip stuff from that era, Pete Rock, Lord Finesse, whoever, but it's just, it will never date because it's just it's not adulterated it's just like it is that thing it now do you do you are you are you like cypher sounds in that you prefer your the first era of primo because like Sife Sife really isn't as into the second era of primo as i am like i'm i'm very because when i was a college radio dj in 97 that's when i was every single b-side primo was doing i was getting the vinyl play on my show and i was into all of it but yeah, Sype but, was already transitioning and was kind of like, ah, I like the old premiere. No, 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 no. Because, because what, first of all, I'm sure he's not talking about like 
love sick and like these are the words i manifest he's talking about like kicking the door which is already like a second era of premiere to the third era that thing to me is still like rappers are in danger and yeah all the like you said all the b-sides and i still loved it just as much and i love the gangstar records from that era i mean what year is all for the cash that's got to be like 98 yeah, like, come on, like, I yes, I'm no, still. Oh no! And by the way, it just should be noticed because Sipe would be upset. All for the cash, maybe like his favorite Gangstar song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He adores that song. Yeah, but he doesn't like the quick scratch hook. Primo. I know, I know. I, I do. I, I, I listen. Some of them was he just giving them out like, hey, I'll give you this one. I'm. A, it felt like that to some extent, but I actually enjoy almost all of them. Yes, because uh, because even if the words are sometimes like, yeah, you know that, like, it doesn't matter. It's the percussive way that he's cutting them up that makes that scratch an instrument. Like Stevie Wonder to me is a singer, but his voice is also like an instrument. Like, it doesn't really matter what he's saying. It's just like a beautiful fucking trumpet solo. Do you know what, uh, do you know what album celebrated 25 years last week? Oh, God. Oh. Yeah. Oh, wow. Shit is wild. <laughs> Can't complain. I, I'm going to go ahead and call this one of the great underrated rap albums of all time. Uh, do you know what you guys could do? You could actually do a name that tune show because it's so hard to hear whatever you're playing on that end that anyone who could know that would have to be such a fan. <laughs> well, the funny thing is when I'm recording it, it's perfect for the audience. So they'll hear it like it's perfect. Yeah, and now I sound like an idiot because it took me five seconds to guess group home. But like, if you heard what I was hearing, it's like, it's little, it's like under a swimming pool, under a bank, under a nightclub where the DJ is playing it. It's fucking crazy. No, no, it's awful. And by the way, so much so that it's not group home. I'm, I'm sad I can't leave you out here like this. What the fuck is it? I can't hear it. It's OC, my world. Oh my God, see? Like it sounded like every day. Oh, uh <laughs> That's, Yo, I don't know why. I don't know what's going on with that. Um, but I, yeah, this this album has some great that's, premiere. Is that the second album, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This joint with Freddie Fox. Number two back on the map. Perhaps you thought I was born. Well, surprise, nigga. Now, when Freddie you Fox know, it's a, going by Bumpy Nux for the first time. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. I hope you're enjoying those songs. I can only imagine how <laughs> great they sound. Um, I love. I love love and affection for the America is dying slowly thing. Wow. That was a real weird, like B-side wow. of those seeds, but that was just such a great beat. I'm such a sucker for a vibraphone. That, no, I, I, that I have a question. First of all, even by one up standards, I wonder how much people remember America is dying slowly. Yeah. The only thing that people would remember from America is dying slowly which, by the way, conceptually, it's crazy that it even exists. Yeah. But the only thing they'd remember is this. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Is that, I can only imagine, is that Lost Boys? That's Lost Boys, okay. the yard. I can yes, hear a little right. bit of like freaky tie, like in my tiny <laughs> bit of my right headphone. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but that's so crazy because, so for anyone listening who has no idea we're talking about, they came out with a compilation and called America is Dying Slowly, AIDS. And it was about, it was rap artists doing songs, some of which about the topic at hand. And I think it was all to raise money. I believe it yeah, was. Yeah, it was. It was, it, was, it, was right? it was the same people that did the Red Hot and Blue, but it was like their hip hop version of it. Oh, yeah. God. Okay. So it was a charity album, but like. It's just interesting because I have it. You, do you get the vinyl? Like, yeah, it's, it's, of course. I played. I'm sure I played one or two of the songs in the club. Yeah, like it was. It was good, yeah. but it also was so. It was like inherently depressing. Like you look at the jacket; yeah, course, it was a little depressing at all um, time. Uh, it's. It, I remember you. You shouted out the new Black Thought Danger Mouse record, and I was thinking to myself, of really funny, interesting, uh, very nerdy hip hop trivia is that. Renee is one of Danger Mouse's favorite hip hop records, which is just something I never would have guessed. I thought that was kind of a curveball. And what you had that came up in conversation with him? Yeah, I think we we're just talking about Lost Boys, and he he always, whenever we talk about that song, he always jokes about the line, "Shawty's in law school," which means she studied law. What's the line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants I to love be a lawyer. In other words, Shawty studies law. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, those songs. Lights, camera, action, all his guest appearances. Like, I mean, I was such a sucker for 
I mean, Lost Boys did Lex Coop's Humans in the Benz probably a little before your time. I probably you were a more underground, but that was no, 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 one no, no. of I the was, biggest I, songs. Oh, and I, I had this. I, I okay, yes, you're correct. I was more into like the lifestyles, of the rich and shameless remix than I was. You know, but I like Jeep's Lex Coop Beam is Benz. I couldn't believe when Flex started going crazy on Jeep's Lex Coop's Beam is in Benz. I just, to me, I at the time, it sounds stupid in retrospect. I don't know how you felt, Mark. I didn't think of it as a hit. Right. Like, it didn't feel like a commercial smash to me. Yeah. Um, and and music makes me high, which is still one of the worst mastered and pressed records to this what day. What like, the to, fuck is a, up with that song? song? How could it be that a song that was so huge and, and like it was just like Bounce Rock Skate, like it probably sounded incredible in the studio, like just was like a tiny clock radio speaker by the time you got in the club and it would still go off. It didn't matter. No, but you're right to me. What with the second you mentioned that I remember, I felt like whenever I was DJing, it made you think the balance in your headphones was off. Yeah, yeah. Like when you're playing like an old Prince record when he's only singing on one side and you're hearing yeah. a crazy delay vocal. And you'd be like, you'd be at the night like, okay, I can't play it after Tracy Lee, the theme, because that is so loud that people will just think it's, the speakers went out. By the way, I'm glad you brought that up since we're sitting here talking club records with Mark Ronson. I mean, the, the theme doesn't get its real due for how much of a knocker that was at the time. It's not a recurrent, you know, it's a weird thing. Why? Certain records. I know it was, it was, it's got all the elements. It sounds incredible. It's sampling an older school record. It's it's odd which ones. I mean, maybe it goes off sometimes when I hear Cypher, some oh, of the DJs. Then you're not going to hear it again. Are you ready to not hear the song? Yeah. I love it. Okay. Having a party. Tracy is a, a lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, she studied law. Tracy. Bye, Storm. Oh, ain't no mystery. And I feel so bad because Tracy had that verse from Big on Keep Your Hands High. One step beyond. And I feel like no one realizes his song. Yeah. Check it out. Check it out. If you guys don't know, this was a big New York club record. Check it out. This just sounds like when people, when you download the Billy Jean acapella online and it's like the crazy one where the guy just fucked with his RCAs to get the acapella out. Uh -huh. That's what the music sounds like. Yo, man, are you enjoying? Uh, this is so generic, and I generally don't care what people feel about this, but I do with you. Um, where are you at? Ugh, I, I want to cringe even asking it because I get asked so much and don't have anything to say. Uh, are you fucking with new shit right now? Where are you at with the hip hop today? Oh, boy. Uh, I, you know, I, I would. I, Listen, I'm not playing four or five nights a week in the clubs. I mean, I'm barely playing, you know, one gig like that a month. But so I don't have to be up on it every now and then. I try and immerse myself in it. And like play some of the new records of the drill shit and people just I have this theory that like the crowd has a sixth sense to tell if a record is you or not when you play it. Okay. And it could be a record that the DJ after me play and people go crazy for, but it's just like, and maybe it's because people associate me now with a certain kind of music. What I find myself doing a lot is just like making edits of my own remixes of some of the new shit so I can like make it palatable to me. But I, I, I don't, I haven't, I can't remember the last time I like kind of put a new record into the set, you know? So what is a what is a Mark Ronson set generally? Generally, like I know you don't like the word open format, but you you're you're everything you're playing at this point. Yeah, at this point, like when I play, I'm playing like good funk, disco, gold. I mean, golden era is so weird because I realize when I say golden era, I think of like ninety two to or ninety four to ninety nine, and most people when they say golden era, they're talking about like Kane, Cold Chilling, eighty eight to ninety two. So whatever. Yeah. Just, just you. that, just shit that I love. I, I kind of play fucking everything, and then I'll make edits of like a new Drake or a Beyonce song or something, so I can play it. And if there's something new that really, what do you like, mean you'll make a new edit? What will you do to it? I'll just find the stems and just make my own version of it. If it's like just you know, just break it down to like you know, just different. Just so is that just so you can play a hit record, but also give it its own feel? Yeah, just so when it feels when I play it, it doesn't look like I'm just kind of like chasing the fucking spotify charts well, and also like you're that. kind of like honestly you don't I, I i don't think you have the luxury like i got booked for a wedding i, I never i never dj these days but i'm doing a wedding this fall 
um, the, the groom is like a big fan of mine. And so the, the fiance asked me if I do it. I said, sure. So I'm doing this wedding and like, I have the luxury of like, I'll show up, I'll, I'll, I'll practice a little bit before and try to get my shit together, but I can just play hits and no one's going to think anything. So I'm like, Oh, Rosenberg was here. We had a good time, play a good song. You have an expectation of like somewhat of a musical journey. I feel like during a, a DJ set. I do. And I, I still fucking, it doesn't matter if I'm playing like 200 people, 10,000 people at a festival. I still get like the fucking crazy, like just the panic attack nerves before. And I have to know what the first three songs are. And I have to be doing something interesting. And usually I try and work out some mix or blend. That's like just difficult enough that I could maybe fucking fall on my ass. Like I need the weird, the, the nerves and the thing of mixing two records that are not on click and whatever like so it's, it's still this thing that i have to walk this tightrope which is nuts but yeah i have to feel like i'm i, I can't I, my worst fear is like doing a decent enough job and knowing that like anyone could have played that night that they could go home and just be like that was very nice i really danced all night like i i need to know that they like it had to be me and that that is a fucking that has a good side and a bad side too because sometimes you could just be playing for a, a crowd that knows what's up that's cool and you're just trying so hard to smash oh, them in the face is, there it's, is nothing worse than trying to keep up with a cool crowd and you're in your own head about it and you're like uh they all know like uh, like i've had gigs that i did when i first started getting really into 45s mark it's so cringe now that i think about it when i started getting into 45s which is now jesus it's like 10 eight nine years ago but when i first started doing it you know i wanted to get out right away because i was all excited by 45s all of a sudden so i'm going to these parties that are done by the other people who are into 40 they must have thought i was such a fucking disgrace what did you play like i just generic shit yeah. that i could find on 45 because i yeah. just found the novelty of 45s yeah. as a kid who grew up with 12 inches and like wasn't a dance hall dj i didn't have any yeah. understanding of it all yeah. So like, I just was lost. And not only that, I find it hard to do to this day. If I play a 45 set I, in a venue out, do not expect Latch could go to the park yeah. and on a wobbly table blend 45s. Yeah. If I'm at a venue with like, a, and it's very loud, I'm just hoping to like seamlessly drop one yeah. record in after another. That's all I'm going for in 45. I, I remember the the reggae dudes all played 45 and then Bismarck Key would kill the 45 set. And he had this plastic platter that is that what everyone's using? It's like a, a plastic 12 inch platter that the 45 just slots in the middle of, or are you literally playing with the middles and stuff? No, like no, no. I, 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 yeah, no, I, I, I'm taking out the little 45 adapter, putting it. Back oh yeah. On. No, no. Like I remember seeing Biz like just kill it at speed or something one night, and at the end it was a different era, obviously. But he would play like weird old like racist KKK songs like on a forty five or like uh, like like on and off very quickly. But I, I just uh, you know I, this book that I'm writing now, and I'm not trying to plug it too hard because who knows when I'll be finished. But I hope you'll enjoy it because basically it's not just about the '90s and the club scene because that obviously was very fun, but. I don't know if anybody's really written the book about the pathology of the DJ, like how we think about shit. I think about certain things like, okay, in a nightclub, you have room A, which is this wonderful room and like everybody's having the greatest time and they're dancing and sweaty and there's sexual energy, platonic energy, all this shit going on. And there's room B, like a fucking closet with tatted carpet and no one's gonna come in and someone might ask you every five hours if you want another vodka and cranberry, but we've all said we're room beers, right? And obviously everybody for different reasons. Some of it's ego, some of it's your fucking introvert. So there's, that's stupid to even try and list because we know everybody has a combination of those reasons. But things like that and just the coming home after a gig, what, what you said made me think about it. I talk about coming home after a gig and like, it doesn't, you cannot fall asleep for at least two hours. You come off at three in the morning, you are lying there. Now that I'm a grown up, I'm lying there trying not to wake my wife up in bed. And the only thing that I can picture is like the girl who just looked at me like when I played hip hop parade, which maybe that's not the right record, but that I just went a little too far. Oh, I know I just went too broad. You know, like when you just, when you've, when you've got it all, I'm not talking jump around, but I'm just talking like that one record just a bit too far and on all that's replaying I, I, like a fucking gif in your head is the girl that just looked to you. It's like, oh really? Yeah. Hip hop parade? Hip -hop parade huh? mm, yeah, that's where we're at, huh? And, and you know, it's hard. It's hard because 
we all have records like that that we like and yeah. you're banking on you either have to have you're either banking on that other people feel the same way or that they think you're cool enough that you're going to make them rethink that record when they hear it yeah there's it's wonderful to watch some of the records come back around now like scrubs which is something that i'm sure i put to bed for 15 years and that's a re that's an example of a record i'll get the stems make a nice drop out of it so it's like just the roads and if you had a show that you don't you know yeah things just making them make a different experience than maybe just playing the record but i think about um i totally forgot what i was gonna say oh i, no, I was you, what did you say before something super profound but then yeah. but then you went to tlc scrubs. scrubs yeah i just thinking about records oh, oh, that... pushing people with you're, you're you're asking them to to maybe rethink a record because you played it you know what yeah, i mean yeah no it's gone. like Sorry. I'm, it's gone so i'm not even gonna bother anymore. but, but... Like, I, don't, I don't i don't always know oh. there it is it's back he's got it go ahead no, but this is this is a new thought, but a, but an offshoot. What's crazy is a record. I gotta be honest. I'm disappointed. It's not the original thought. But go ahead. I it might be a baby sister. I will go out and see a kid play a record, a 23 year old kid play a record that I didn't know that you could bring back already. That to me might have been cheesy, and to see mm -hmm. people go fucking ape shit to him, be like, oh cool. Like that's the other thing. Like I'll be in the studio, like well, somebody young will come in a Travis or uh, I, whoever. And I'll think that like, oh, I've got to make something with 808s and make it loud. And cause, like, how do I bring my shit to their shit? And they'll just, just before I'm about to play my beats, just play me what they're working on up to that point. And it's all break beats and shit that I would love to be doing that I would have done 25 years ago, but would never think to do it. And it would seem derivative and I wouldn't know. And that's probably the point that only a 22 year old right. should be doing that now right. is what makes it fresh. Yes. Like, like I, I often think about that with Tyler, you know, Tyler, when, when I first started interviewing him and he would make fun of me and be like, you old motherfucker, you're so old. You like old shit. You old, old, old. Substitution drums, the <laughs> substitution drums. And, and yeah. now like it's literally, he got DJ drama, a Grammy putting drama on his album. Yeah. Like, he went completely retro and the but it's so much cooler drums. coming from him and the lumberjack drums are substitution no of course but i think that's the thing like it's like it has to be that generation to reinterpret it and like every now and then i'll take i'll take something if if, if one of those young guys wants to hook an old guy up you know i totally got catfished by that tyler do you see when tyler got hacked and no. he tweeted oh uh i got a i got a message from a, a fake chris clancy account you know tyler's manager no. said, hey tyler's been Tyler's been, uh, you know, really would love to get in the studio with you. He's been thinking about, uh, he's a big fan of stuff that you've done. And, uh, you know, no. love, to, love to play you where the record's at. Um, wait, wait, anyway. wait, 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 when was this? When was this? It's like two months ago. But that's totally ago. believable. Maybe. I mean, I've met him a couple of times. He's always friendly. But, uh, but of course, it's going to my ego like, oh, I guess there's some tricks left in this old guy yet. You know, like, I'm back, baby. So, uh, so I send it to... Uh, don't they not just make Lady Gaga music? Here we go. Yeah, uh, I'm back, baby. And <laughs> I, I send it to my friend Harley, and I'm kind of like pretending to play down the the, the brag part. I'm like, yeah. what do you think? What kind of stuff should I do? Like, like da 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 da. da. And he's like, I don't know, bro. And then he just sends me back the screenshot of a tweet from Tyler that says, "Hey, real sorry, someone's been hacked into my account pretending to be my manager, soliciting stuff. We never send emails. We always call." just no and i was like oh wow that's crazy and no, i had some i was about is, to go and make the fire that is, <laughs> that is fucking, i mean i'm sorry it takes such pleasure if someone so successful could have that happen to them is hilarious because i would have totally bought it yeah why why wouldn't tyler hit you up come on that's what i was thinking apparently not <laughs> And I think I even posted like a tweet back to his thing, like with a, with like probably like a fishing expedition on my part. Like, oh man, I had the fire. <laughs> Crickets back. Yo, that is unbelievable. You know what? I'll let you go right there because that's fucking fantastic. Um, so when eventually one day, there's a couple things we gotta talk about. When you're when you finally get ready for your book or any other time you feel like coming on when Sipes here. I want there's a lot more from the clubs to talk to. I, I didn't ask you really for any Jay-Z stories. I I didn't get to ask you at all about 
your sister well you have you have a ton of step siblings by the way you have like 19 step siblings but specifically samantha yeah. and your impact on her as a dj and your guys kind of dj relationship i i i don't know if this is i mean it is public information it's on your wikipedia page but you and i have the same gimmick you are also divorced you are yeah you are in the divorce gang. Yeah. Uh, congratulations. You just got married, right? The no, honey- got engaged. Okay. So Cuba was not a honeymoon. No, Cuba was okay. not. A, it was on a sneaky honeymoon. Okay. We're still, we're still just engaged. Yeah. But you're, how, tell me, is, is marriage number two? Is marriage number two what it's all about? It's, it's all, it's it. It's the, the wifey for lifey. It's great. It's like, we know what we did wrong. There were reasons nobody was at fault, but it's just like, it's, that this is the grown up. This is what's wonderful. I needed to be married the first time so I could be single probably when I met this amazing fucking dream woman of my life. So it's, that, that, it's that's okay, that, that feels very good. And, and by the way, it's, it's similar to how I describe my relationship with Max Ennings, except I, I think everyone was at fault. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or if you ask DJ Academics, he has a whole different theory on exactly what happened there. Wow. But um, Mark, it is a pleasure. We truly appreciate um that you're like such a supporter of the podcast it just it, it makes it makes both of us feel very cool we appreciate it i joined it. patreon for you guys too i, I know even, i didn't even know what it was billy right, june right. just did the research you're still paying for patreon because i was going to feel bad if you'd quit uh, okay um, worried mark ronson couldn't afford 750 a month i was like shit the, the the shallow the shallow and uptown funk checks would have really dried up you know yeah yeah and the numbers are going up you guys keep saying that's they good are. they're going they're having up. a nice nice renaissance for the show yeah, I'm feeling that way. I'm a little disappointed that like I had another special guest I was working on for today and I was hoping he'd come on at the same time as you and it would have been a great combination. Yeah. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. So you'll hear when he pops up and be like, that would have been cool. All right, sweet. Mark, thank you, dude. Of course, later. Later, dude. The great Mark Ronson, one app loyalist. I mean, not to be self-referential before the podcast even over. Billy June, I mean, that was that was fantastic shit from Mark Ronson. That was epic. He brought the fucking ruckus. That was epic. What a fucking interesting dude. And there's so much more shit, but like, I didn't want it to go into like full interview zone. I was trying to make it more like uh, an episode of just me and Sife shooting the shit. So it turned out great. Um, uh, I want to give a shout out to myself who had the idea to contact Mark. Tremendous idea. Um, and shout out to Billy June and Emilio for holding things down on the production side. And, uh, tomorrow night I'm recording a Patreon episode with a special guest. That'll be fun. Hopefully people don't think we have too many white people on this week. I do want everyone to know the other special guest I was going for tonight was not white. In fact, multiple non-white people turned down guest appearances on one app. Okay. So I was relegated to white people. I just want to be clear. So everyone knows. Um, but yeah, shout out to all of our patrons and everyone who's uh, going to be joining Patreon so you can join the likes of uh, of Mark Ronson. Sife, hope you're having a great time with LL Cool J. Come back and do the show sometimes, you piece of shit. Later, guys.